Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Asia Global Institute. Uh, my name is Alejandro Reyes. I'm Director of Knowledge Dissemination at the Asia Global Institute. I've only been here about a month, so uh, thanks very much again for coming. And um, just want to introduce our director, uh, uh, Chen Ji Wu, who's, who's, who's sitting there, and uh, we have some colleagues here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, not only you, but to welcome our speaker, um, Paul Evans, uh, professor at the University of British Columbia. Uh, You've probably seen his uh, um, CV or bio in the, in the posters and in the announcements, so I, I really won't get into that because we want to hear from Paul. I would only say, uh, in the spirit of the times, that when it comes to China and Asian studies in Canada, Paul is sort of like the um, Kawhi Leonard of, uh, of um, Asian studies. Although, uh, Kawhi Leonard is a... Kawhi Leonard is a small forward, and Paul is really quite tall, so maybe I should you know, call him the sort of Steve Nash, maybe, but you're not retired, see? Steve Nash is already retired, so Paul is very much active, in particular, in the multi-track dialogues that exist, uh, and they're very important in terms of not only Canada-China relations, but just China relations with China uh, from all parts of the world. And so, Paul... Uh, if I might, uh, just the floor is yours. And we'll, you'll talk for a bit, and then we'll have a discussion. Yeah, great. Uh, oh, OK. Well, uh, so uh, uh, yes, full disclosure, uh, until about a month ago, I was uh, the uh, senior policy advisor to the assistant deputy manager of the Asian Pacific was managing a um, Asia Pacific Policy Planning uh, in the Foreign Ministry of Canada. So again, thank you very much, and Paul, please. Uh, how is the voice? Is it, does it come through well? Well, thank you, Al, for a very um, kind introduction. Kawhi Leonard is quite a basketball player. If um, uh, to be compared to a great basketball player is a, is, is a high compliment, particularly because the Toronto Raptors are in the NBA Finals yeah. this year. Yeah. So. I just assumed that knowledge. Just assumed that knowledge, so that's great. And it's wonderful to be, it's my first time to speak at, uh, at this institute, though I have a familiarity with this building and this campus. So I was a visiting professor here for a year, six years ago and enjoyed seeing this building and now seeing how it's being put to use with a, a dynamic institute that's an experiment and in innovation between a university and an independent think tank. Uh, so really thrilled to have a chance to, uh, to be with you. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to know who you are. Uh, who's in the audience today? How many of you are students at the University of Hong Kong? Ah, which professor told you you had to attend today's <laughs> session? <laughs> and uh, how many of you are based here at the, at the Institute, the Asia Global Institute? How many of you are, are staff? Okay. Um, are any of you from governments? Uh, Derry is uh, uh, a key player in the Canadian consulate here. And he's been sent by the government of Canada to make sure I don't say anything too bad <laughs> uh, <laughs> or make too many mistakes today uh, in a presentation. And some of the others, you're from, what brings you here today? Oh, the conference that's going on. In fact, she and I went to the desk. Well, thank you for coming. That's great. Anyone else volunteering? So you're watching what I'm saying too, <laughs> and to make sure I don't get in any trouble. Uh, well, again, thank you for, for coming. And this is an informal presentation. I'm uh, a little tired and a little um, exhausted by a last eight day trip to Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. And I'm coming through Hong Kong with a set of questions in my mind now about the state of Canada-China relations. 
and it is a uh, topic that I'm afraid is not a happy one. The Canada-China relationship now is at its coldest point since we established diplomatic relations in 1970. And I'd, I'd make the case it's also at a, at a colder point than it was in, after June 4th, 1989, where there was a period of several years of difficult relations, but after three or four or five years, things went back towards a, a, a kind of more balanced approach on China. Um, this is a moment of, of, of high negativity in the relationship. And I would use the metaphor of what's happened with Canada and China, not just as an example of a bad thunderstorm or of a snowstorm, bad bit of weather, and a really bad bit of weather. This is true. But I think that what we see now unfolding between Canada and China is an indication of a kind of strategic climate change. That this doesn't, this, we're not going to be going back to where we were uh, in our relationship with China, <clears throat> nor in our relationship with the United States, nor in the world. This is a, uh, uh, a significant moment. And I thought a way to do that would be to speak through two sets of issues. Uh, one of them is going to be on the case of uh, Madame Meng Wanzhou and the two Canadians, uh, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, who have been uh, uh, under arrest and are soon to be charged uh, and are in a prison in Beijing. Uh, and to talk a little bit about what that event or those series of events have meant in making this relationship colder in the short term, but also repositioning us in the longer term. And the second thing, if it would be of interest to you, would be to say a little bit about a decision that Canada is facing very quickly on the subject of uh, Huawei and its investment in our 5G uh, system uh, that will be uh, a decision that is pending before either this government or uh, the government that's in place after October. So that's what I'll try to do is use those two points to help us get, a, get to give, give you an impression of what is going on in our bilateral relationship, but how this is a much bigger story than a Canada-China story. That there are things in the background here that are reshaping the relationship, and that's going to have a lot to do with the United States and U.S.-China relations, but a broader shifting balance of power and where Canada is going. So, uh, do all of you know the name Meng Wanzhou? Everybody in the room is looking around. We, you've been following the story. And after her arrest in Canada on a, on a basis, she was detained on the basis of an extradition request from the United States. And what happened after that has been a series of retaliatory and escalatory moves by China in the arrest, we think, of uh, detention, to be more technically correct, of um, two Canadians uh, and uh, another issue related to a Canadian who was charged with a drug offense and had his case revisited and for a death penalty kind of escalation. Uh, uh, further Chinese escalation was on banning particular kinds of canola sales, which is a big crop that Canada produces and four or five other measures in total, I think, seven steps of escalation. On the Canadian side, there have also been acts of escalation. And principally, it was the approach of the Canadian government to uh, publicizing and internationalizing the situations of those two Canadians, the two Michaels. The Canadian government made an effort to publicly uh, denounced China for what they saw as an illegal or an improper detention, but they brought other countries into the mix. And those other countries, um, uh, 16 or 17 or 18, were asked to make public statements uh, about this, 
to criticize China for its behavior and say that this was not in uh, the tradition of rule of law or international law. And several countries did uh, do that. As I say, 15, 16, 17, a lot of countries didn't uh, agree to that request. But by internationalizing the issue, uh, Canada was uh, trying to put pressure on Beijing to work towards a, a settlement of this issue. Uh, and we're uh, now in a situation where the worry is that those escalations may continue uh, and that they're in various ways. Canada may be pushing back against China uh, in uh, areas, uh, there's several things, everything from not training Chinese athletes in Canada to some visa issues that are being played with to some views on investment. Uh, and these are not yet announced or in play, but are possible. So we're in a situation not where Madame Mung's case and the two Michaels case, we're not thinking of a solution at this point. We're trying to think through how to stop making this situation worse, uh, de-escalation strategies. And my trip to China on this visit was to talk very informally. I'm a professor, not a, not a government official, and certainly not a minister or uh, the high level people that we're going to need ultimately to get involved in these discussions. Uh, but we were there to try to talk with Chinese counterparts about what could be done to stop the bleeding. Uh, before, before trying to, to reverse if that comes at a later point. And all I can say is that it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because I think now of the level of anger, emotional feelings on both sides. Chinese think we kidnapped a Chinese princess, a person from a company that was pretty remarkable and that we did so in collusion with the United States as a way of, of pressuring Huawei uh, and uh, embarrassing China. Um, the level in China of desire to push back against Canada, to hit back, to use some of these escalatory uh, is, is very real. And they were quietly willing to speak with us about what some of those other steps could be. Not as a threat, but to say that this is the direction that it might go. On the Canadian side, which I can maybe say a little bit more about in detail, there is a very deep anger with China uh, in the public, among our elites, in the media, uh, in our political parties. We've been doing some public opinion polling on Canadian views of China, and we've been doing these polls every seven months for the last three years, uh, every last two years, excuse me. And in the last poll that we did in March, after Madame Meng's arrest, we found that the favorability index for China had dropped 16 points. And it was already low to start with, uh, so it's very low. We also found, by the way, in that poll that the favorability index for the United States was down 14 points. Uh, and so one gets a sense of the intensity of this, uh, this situation as it's affected Canadian views of both countries. Uh, and we are finding that in our political parties, uh, that uh, as they are gearing up for an election, Canada has a federal election in October, that both parties are looking pretty seriously at what their platforms are going to be. Mr. Scheer, the leader of the Conservative Party in Canada, gave a major speech on foreign policy uh, uh, three weeks ago. And in it, it was some pretty strong language about China. Uh, and uh, it's uh, bad behavior, it's authoritarian system, and a statement that China is not a rule-governed country, does not believe in international law, and that we need to find w new ways to push back against China, maintain commercial relations, but on other matters, treat China not, not as a friend, but as something approaching an adversary uh, or an enemy. The kind of line we have seen uh, from some Americans, and particularly Vice President uh, Pence. And uh, our opposition, the Conservative Party, have made the case that if elected, they will uh, end Canadian involvement in the Asian, infrastructure, Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank, 
and that they will not allow, they will ban Huawei from uh, involvement in our 5G system. Now, what people say before an election is not necessarily what they're going to do. But I, I, I'll make a case to you why I think this time a harder line against China, and in fact, a reorientation of our policy if a conservative government is elected is likely. Uh, the liberals, our ruling party, Mr. Trudeau's uh, government, are in the midst of some very difficult internal problems uh, related to uh, domestic issues. But uh, the Trudeau government is being widely perceived as being too soft on China. Uh, that its approach has been, uh, has not been sufficient to deter Chinese actions and that he's not strong enough in the actions that he's going to take in, in rebuttal. We do not have high level invoice going back and forth for discussion. Our government to government relationship with China is frozen. Uh, our, um, some of our ministers uh, and ministerial visits frozen. Uh, there are some, some diplomats who are able to have discussions, but we are not even able now to use our track two instruments that we used to use. These are these special groupings that are non-governmental technically, but involve government people in their private capacities. That's been difficult. We organized a meeting three weeks ago on China, Canada, and the Arctic. And we invited, we wanted to do it as a track two meeting, but we were told by both sides that that wasn't possible now. But if it was an academic meeting and some government officials were invited as guests, then that was okay. But that's at a lower level uh, of these matters, and then we have our normal academic relations. So this is a moment of, um, uh, of real difficulty, and a Canadian public and a Canadian press. The media, if you read Canadian media, if you look at social media in Canada, there's a lot of highly negative things said about China, but also the view that it is time for us to change our engagement strategy on China towards something else. So this impact on opinion, at least in the short term, uh, and elite opinion, is very serious. Uh, and we are trying to then find a way that in the midst of these very strong emotions, the anger, Canadians feel that there are two people improperly imprisoned, that they are not being treated very well at a moment where Madame, uh, Madame Meng is living under house arrest in a very beautiful mansion uh, in, in Vancouver, where our two guys are in pretty difficult prison conditions. So <clears throat> in that context, the anger is there. We have been trying to see if there are ways that we can build some confidence again, not to be able to resolve this clash, but to keep it from getting worse. And this, one of the examples we raised with our Chinese friends, uh, can we still use the word friends? Uh, I think we can in some in very specific settings. Uh, we um, got into a matter of what kind of steps could be taken by each government to uh, reduce tensions a wee bit. And to give one example, we felt it was very important that the specific treatment of the two Michaels, the actual terms of their imprisonment, what materials they have access to, who can visit them, what kind of things, even some small steps that could be signaled to the Canadian public, recognizing that there are regular routines in Chinese prisons but there's a variety of discretionary areas that the government could act on. So to, 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 to do some of those and signal them to the Canadian side might be something that, uh, if it could happen, could lower some of the tensions. Similarly, on the other side, one of the issues we discussed was how Canada's internationalization of the issue should proceed at its next stage and whether somewhat less of a high profile on these matters, some rather different language by the Canadian side, might be a signal without, without changing our basic position, but just some signaling around that, that we have reached a, a level that we can maintain without trying to 
drop through the floor again. So those are some of the things under discussion around um, uh, Meng Wanzhou and uh, the two Michaels, because there are many people in my university, in our country, for whom this issue is a deep emotional and heartfelt one. Remember how the Americans felt when their um, uh, people in their embassy were arrested in uh, Iran in the 1970s? Remember the kind of emotions that came out? No, that was a lot more people. It was a bigger scale. But remember those emotions. You can't understand contemporary American policy towards Iran without remembering those moments, those anger, that anger that the Americans had at seeing their, their hostages, their diplomats as hostages. And the scale is different, but I think the emotions are the same, and these may be long-lasting. And that spills over then into some of the decisions that the Canadian government needs to make, whether it's this government in the next few months before the election, or a new government, uh, liberal or conservative or whatever. Uh, and the most pressing and high profile of those issues is Huawei's involvement in our 5G system. And this is a complicated issue. Technically, politically, every country that is looking at this matter is looking at a variety of concerns, price and technology, but particularly cybersecurity concerns. And I think it's fair to say that before this chill, before this, this difficult period in, started in December, the Canadian professionals were tending towards an assessment of Huawei that was, there are concerns. Uh, there's real examples of uh, Huawei activities that are seen as, um, uh, as dangerous from a cybersecurity perspective. But on balance, the view was that those worries were exaggerated as presented by the United States. Secondly, that uh, those particular problems could be identified and mechanisms set up to increase, to some degree, trust uh, that, and verification uh, on Huawei equipment and other things. And there was also a third view that is quite important, is that some of our officials uh, uh, several months ago were of the view that we do have a cybersecurity issue uh, and, uh, with reference to our current systems, but also 5G, but it was not just about China as a threat. It was also about other countries uh, that had access uh, and that in fact could, uh, as needed, uh, both uh, uh, build in back doors, do a whole number of things if they wished and as they had done in practice. And that was the concern about the United States. Uh, in a serious Canadian discussion, the name Edward Snowden occasionally comes up. So that was the professionals. and how we were going to come to a decision like the United Kingdom, different than Australia, different than the United States, was an open debate. We had some good arguments about this, and how you weigh this factor or that factor. Um, but in the last few months, that's become increasingly difficult to even have that kind of rational policy discussion. It is now um, often, often presented as a matter of first public attitudes that people don't like Huawei because it's a Chinese company. Uh, they don't like Huawei because it is seen that Huawei stole secrets from one of our industrial uh, technological players, Nortel, that in essence broke its, uh, uh, its capacity to innovate in an area. So there's a lot of negativity, but the Hmong affair has made this much sharper. If we go to a group, if I had, if I ask you who you were, if I had 25 students and 25 people from the public in Canada, and I said we had just spent four days in Huawei, the question would be, why are you hanging out with a Chinese company that steals secrets, that is involved in the repression in Xinjiang, and that is quintessentially a Chinese company? And for that, whatever else we know, no way. And so the feelings of people are very strong on this. But the new factor as well is pressure from the United States. And in a combination of both threats, but also incentives, uh, America has been putting, United States has been putting a great deal of pressure on Canada to, um, to ban Huawei. Now, exactly what a ban means is interesting. 
because uh, it can be everything from Huawei uh, products like their cell phones uh, through to their services, through to their research and development activities, through the equipment they might be putting into a 5G system. Uh, Huawei's business activities, and as you know, it's a company that has a remarkably wide agenda. Uh, the hard, the, most people are talking about the equipment, the routers, and the software that go into the 5G system. But Huawei is doing a lot of other things already. So is a ban going to mean, uh, many Canadians are telling me now, we won't buy a Huawei uh, smartphone. How many of you have a Huawei smartphone? Sorry? I don't have it right now. You don't have it now. And you're going to buy it out of a political protest? And you're going to do it as a political protest? You want to support your country. You want to support your country. And it's a good product. Okay. But not many of you have Huawei cell phones. Um, but you won't buy Apple. Why? A political protest against the United States. And it's. Uh, uh, and it's well, this is really interesting. I was down in, uh, uh, I bought a new phone while I was here, and I went to several of the shops, and I said, how are your Huawei sales going here in Hong Kong? And they said, uh, uh, you know, they didn't want to say, but they felt that the prices on the, uh, the new P30 Pro were likely to decline soon, because many customers were unwilling to buy them not so much out of politics, but out of fear that the operating systems are now going to be, you know, under after the May 15th regulations, are going to make Huawei a little bit more of a problem. Uh, and it might not be able to be as competitive a product as it was in the past. Well, what I'm getting at is that uh, in the Canadian scene, we're expecting Huawei sales to continue to decline of those products. And in all of our countries, we're debating what parts of Huawei we want to continue in our country. But I'm, I'm making the case to you that right now, I think that the Canadian position is likely to shift from something that was close to the United Kingdom to something closer to Australia. Don't know that, uh, but it's my prediction of where these different forces are playing through. We won't know for a while. Our uh, decision is going to be postponed for at least several, several more months. But that's the background to it. Now, why does this matter? Well, Canada is a small country. Uh, in Huawei sales, for example, it's less than 0.3%. 0.3% of, of Huawei sales. So it doesn't matter. But I think uh, China, I think Huawei, I think the Canadian government, and I think the American government understand that this is just one part of a much bigger issue. And the... Um, all-out American assault against Huawei that was you know, aligned on the May 15th um, proclamation uh, by the president on the entity list and other forms of hard, hard risks for working with Huawei. Uh, that um, we are into a moment where this is the first example of what I would call the new techno-nationalism. And what techno-nationalism means is countries have always been concerned about technology transfers that relate to the military, that have dual-use capabilities, et cetera. This is something different. There may be an ingredient of that. But what is different about the current Huawei case is this is really about a Chinese company that is being very effective and um, uh, very uh, innovative in an area of high technology that will have big economic importance. I mean, $120 billion sales last year is a, a, a lot of sales. But more importantly, I think techno-nationalism is about when you take an, a subject that is primarily of commercial uh, or of educational interest and you securitize it 
you see that, that company or those activities as matters of national power and national security. So that my, my basic reading of the American attack on Huawei is some of it is about cybersecurity, some of it is about those risks, but it's fundamentally about America putting pressure on a country that, and, a, and a particular company that has the capacity to be a full leader in the fourth industrial revolution. That this, in this new era of these multiple uh, new kinds of technologies, 5G is important. But beyond that, it's a, Huawei is an example of a Chinese company that is out competing uh, some countries, companies uh, and processes outside of China. And I, I would put it this way, that I, I see behind the American push on this a fear of a new kind of competitor to United States dominance. Well, not necessarily in the military domain, but in the domain of the commanding heights of particular industrial sectors. And the techno-nationalism is this way of, of securitizing economic competition. And, and let me give you a, a metaphor that, I, that, that might help on this. Um, I spend a lot of time with our American friends in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard. And over the last five years, I've seen a big change in attitudes among a lot of Americans. Five years ago, there was a view that a rising China uh, posed some kinds of threats and some kinds of challenges to the United States. Uh, that um, China had grown uh, and was a, was a bigger competitor. But that eventually, that very quickly, China would run into a ceiling. That it could be an imitator rather than an innovator. That it could be a, uh, uh, a manufacturer rather than a design hub. And so that it was going to hit a ceiling. And it was going to hit a ceiling for two reasons. One was the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and a state-directed economy that could not produce the really cutting-edge innovations. Secondly, is that Chinese culture and institutions for doing the basic science, as well as engineering and technology, were not caught up with the West, uh, uh, and that they were still dependent on the outside. Well, that was five years ago. Now it's the reverse. The view is that China can innovate. It can innovate in a world-class way, uh, and that it can do so partly because of the Chinese Communist Party and a political system that allows the focus of resources in strategic areas in ways that the United States rarely does. Of course, the United States did a moon project that was not the product of, of private American companies. The United States built an atomic bomb on the basis of state-directed uh, investment and, and innovation. But in general, their system doesn't do this very well. The Chinese system, for all of its problems, suddenly there's a formula that is allowing some of these Chinese companies to be world leaders. And I think it's that recognition that China really is a competitor in innovation. I'll give an example. Our scientists at UBC uh, who uh, like to work with Huawei, we have several grants and research grants from Huawei, uh, and um, I asked them why they will work with Huawei. Some of them have ethical concerns about Huawei as a Chinese company, and some of them are concerned about surveillance systems in Xinjiang, et cetera. But on balance, they say, we like working with Huawei. I say, why? First answer, why they like working with Huawei is they like the money. Uh, they just simply, the research money is helpful, and they can use it for their purposes. Secondly, they've, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Second, they have found Huawei to be one of the most flexible companies in the private sector that they work with. Huawei is willing to change the terms of agreements, for example, on uh, 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 intellectual property rights, copyright issues. They made agreements with Huawei, but when the university said it wasn't such a good agreement, Huawei renegotiated it very quickly and in a way that, excuse the phrase, some of them saw as a win-win for both sides. But the third reason is most important. Some of them are now, our scientists are making the case 
that Huawei is not just ahead in certain technology and engineering areas, it's, it's ahead, but that it's gonna be there for a long time. And the reason is not just because of a magic invention, but because their ecosystem for innovation and their connection to the natural sciences work in physics and other areas, which used to be something and, and still is where I think America has a great advantage. But Huawei is catching up very quickly in those areas. And our scientists tell me that in several fields now, to be a world-class scientist, you need to work with the Chinese. Now, that raises all kinds of security risks and other challenges, but it's an indicator of how serious this, this competition is. So I think then, if I can pull this together at the end, I mentioned that we face some very complicated issues in Canada-US relations, as well as Canada-China relations. And some of that is Canadians on balance are not fans of the Trump administration. We haven't liked the way we've been treated in our negotiations with the American side, but it's deeper than that. It's a view that uh, Mr. Trump's government, Mr. Trump is the great disruptor. And basically the institutions, practices, and norms of a, an international order that was <clears throat> never perfect, never all right, but generally pretty good. And one that Canadians back the United States in building multilateral institutions, WTO, a variety of international institutions and norms, there's a, there's a widespread feeling that the United States is unraveling the system that it created. And uh, this is something of deep concerns to serious Canadians, that we, um, can we trust the Americans the way we used to? Never trust the Americans fully, never. Never trust anybody fully, except your mother. Uh, and uh, never, uh, but in this case, there is a, is a trust deficit that was reinforced by the structure of our negotiations. So we got problems uh, with the United States. And uh, we are finding that Canadians increasingly feel themselves not just caught between a competition between the United States and China, the big conflict, but that we find ourselves in a situation where we are not certain that either of those countries are going to be constructive forces in the kinds of globalization and rule-based order that for a little country or a small country like Canada, middle power, that we've desired to move towards. So let me give a couple of examples of that or let me give a metaphor. Um, in Canada, there is a feeling among some that the United States has thrown Canada under the bus. Uh, in the context of Madame Mung's arrest. Canadian officials did not want to get involved in this, but we got pulled into it because of our American friends demanding it for reasons that we can go into if you wish, but uh, we were doing the American bidding on something that was, um, has really put us into a tough spot with the Chinese. That's true. But what's interesting is that there's a feeling that the United States is not just trying to uh, get Canada involved in this particular Hmong and Huawei case, but that the U.S. is trying now to pull Canada into its coming Cold War with China. So we're not just being um, thrown under the bus, we're being tied to the back of the bus uh, and dragged along. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, at least some people are very worried about this. But the more important part of the bus metaphor is that with this anger with China, with the view that we have now seen the real face of China, that China can't be trusted, uh, that the third part of the bus analogy is that there are many Canadians that now want to get on that bus, the confrontation bus with China. And I think that as we see the platforms of our parties being developed, particularly on the conservative side, their view is that in this situation, the best thing we can do is work with our close ally. We have problems with the United States, but the argument is that maybe in a few years, maybe in a few years, the United States will be more the United States we used to know. That this is a Trump phenomenon that, you know, in five years, uh, four years, two years, six years, whatever you think is the right amount, that the United States will revert more back to normal. Maybe not exactly where it used to be, but that 
to oppose them in the meantime is very stupid uh, tactically. And that even if we don't agree with the Trump confrontation with China, the only smart move is to go along with it. And that's a kind of argument that, um, that we're increasingly seeing on the Canadian side in a new way. So how we're going to manage this, how um, uh, the Canadian government, uh, this government, uh, our bureaucrats manage this, these are big issues. These are the hardest strategic issues that Canada has faced since, certainly since the end of the Cold War with the Soviets, but is now in a, in a context we don't know what the future world order looks like. We are afraid of being home alone in a world that is characterized by national rivalries, strategic rivalries, by countries on multiple sides breaking rules, trying to pursue bilateral or unilateral approaches rather than multilateral. The Canadian world order is something we believe in but may not be sustainable. That's the argument that's in the background of a situation about Madame Meng and a situation about Huawei. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you very much. thank you very much, Paul. Um, if I might uh, take the opportunity uh, uh, as a further question. Um, you have described yourself as engaged uh, in China. Way to go is to engage. There's a lot of talk about how the space for engagers has really narrowed uh, significantly. Uh, in I wonder if you could reflect on that and your own experience. And of course, you uh, do a lot of work with uh, folks in the United States, with uh, China experts there. Um, what, what is happening and what are the consequences you see? Excellent, uh, challenging question. <clears throat> you know, labels can get you in trouble. What is a hawk? What is a dove? What is an owl? Uh, this kind of categorizing. But I think it is fair to say, to use the words that uh, Professor Reyes mentioned, that for many years the basic philosophy of the Canadian government was engagement with China. Now, engagement meant a lot of things. It didn't mean always going along with Chinese, but on balance, the fundamental bet was that bringing China into the international system would be good for the Chinese, but it would also be good for us and the system. Secondly, there was a calculation among some engagers and a lot of the politicos that if China was brought into the international system, uh, and joined international organizations and was uh, allowed to open its economy to global supply chains and other things. That if that happened, that economic openness would produce a push towards political liberalization. As a society and an economy in China opened, that the door would be there for political liberalization. And I think that in those, those were the two fundamental premises of engagement. And, uh, three, I guess there's a third one too, is that China is changing and might change. Now there was a disagreement about whether change meant becoming more like us or becoming more able to deal with the outside world to modernize on China's own terms. There was always a debate about that. Well, that engagement philosophy is running into some problems. Uh, a lot of people don't accept some of those premises. And I think the most important one where the disappointment lies is in the matter of why is political change not happening in China? In fact, the changes that are seen by many are changes going in the wrong directions. That there is more repression in China, that uh, in a host of areas, uh, that the party uh, is dominating the state, party and state are increasingly dominating other forces in society. So this is a long march backwards in this area. And we could argue about that, but I think many of us feel there's an element of truth in that. So on what grounds do you make the argument 
that um, engaging China in what I call a post-engagement engagement strategy. Don't use those exact same premises. We're going to need to change the argument. First is that I think engagement still is a right, a general approach is the right one because it has been largely successful. The China that we're living with and dealing with now uh, certainly is not perfect, but it's a very different China than when I was a student there in 1976, uh, when um, a cultural revolution was almost at the end, where China was supporting a variety of insurgency movements in other parts of the world, and where um, its ideology was one of, uh, of Maoism. Uh, China hasn't changed completely, but it has moved in a variety of ways. And I think on ways that on balance have been very good for us in the world. So I think that part of engagement you can make a pretty good case for. You can't make the case for engagement around political change in China, at least not in the short term. Do any of you think that in 10 years, China is going to be more repressive than now, about the same? Or maybe is the pendulum going to move back? Is Xi Jinping going to take a new course, or is this, this the course for deeper, permanent authoritarianism? I don't know the answer. We debate this with our students. We debate it with um, where are they going? Is this as far as the pendulum of repression is going, or is that pendulum going to come back? Or in fact, is there no pendulum anymore? It's, uh, it's an authoritarian system for, uh, forever. I, I would bet on that proposition that we have ways of involving ourselves in China that can be agents of micro-constructive change. And that that's something we've always believed in, but I think at least for a while, the doors are still open. Uh, and that uh, we may have to <laughs> close some windows to keep that door open, uh, but that we can do it. But finally, I think one of the strongest arguments for engagement is what is the alternative? And if I can be very crude about it, the alternative to engagement of China now is Cold War with China. Uh, and it uh, uh, is essentially built on the idea that in a variety of sectors, we need to constrain China's growth and capabilities, um, some on the military side, uh, but also on the economic side. The decoupling, this argument we've been hearing about, is the way to move forward. That in essence, the destruction of global supply chains that have been an instrument for China's development and a key to it's the global economy for the last 15, 20, 25 years, depends how you define it, that we break those apart. That we start talking about a world of us and them. That we are separated by values and that we need to separate our economies to some extent. Uh, and some feel almost totally. So for those reasons, I'm still going to make a case for engagement as more along the lines of Canadian interests, uh, more along the lines of uh, Chinese interests. Now, those of us who hold this view, and I think Professor Reyes' question gets into how do ideas get formulated? How is it in a society that different points of view congeal around attitudes? And we're now at a case in the United States where what I would call a confrontational approach to China, is not just about the Trump administration. It's about the Congress. It's about a variety of think tanks. Uh, it's about a, almost a national consensus, almost a national consensus, uh, that has evolved. And in the, the places where I hang out at Harvard, they don't share that national consensus. Most of the Harvard profs are, um, uh, are engagers. Uh, somewhat along the lines that I indicated. But it's getting harder to have a rational debate inside the United States. People who are, uh, I was with a group this morning and somebody self-identified. He said, I'm a panda hugger. And we've heard that phrase. I'm a panda hugger. And he said, no one will listen to me anymore. My response to him privately was, not only will they not listen to you anymore, they see you as a threat. And we have in our country, as well as in the United States, where it's even stronger, a view that to take some of the positions that I've advocated today are not just wrong ideas, you know, that he, this guy misunderstands China, this guy misunderstands Canadian interests, or the United States, but that my views border on disloyalty. 
that China is an enemy. You have to start from that premise. And that further, uh, that um, you are an agent of influence. We have an enormous concern in Canada now around United Front activities, Chinese activities to, uh, some call it soft power, some call it more nice sharp power, intimidation, infiltration. Uh, this is an issue now that Canadians are taking realistically. And there is an argument that many of us who spend time in China are in fact um, playing with the enemy. Uh, that we are um, a risk because our ideas, again, are not just wrong, but that they're trying to distract our government and our students from the real understanding of China. Now, I don't want to overstate that. UBC professors don't lose their jobs because they have bad ideas. But it does remind me of the 1950s in the United States during the McCarthy period and others. And my Harvard friends are very nervous, not so much about mainstream media, but congressional committees that are naming people as um, examples of United Front agents of influence, that American uh, social media, go on to a social media site in Canada or the United States and try to present a balanced case for the Huawei decision. Whatever the decision is, we need to look at this and this and watch what comes out in those comments uh, on it. So I'm afraid that we do have a narrowing zone, but I don't want to overstate it yet. It's not finished. We're not as far down that path as the Americans are, and we have a lot of people that want to keep the debate open. Okay, thank you. Um, open to questions. All we ask is that please identify yourself and your affiliation. Make comments and questions, but please keep it. So thank you, please, yes. Do we need a microphone? Uh, Herman Chan had done business in U.S. and Canada for about eight years in the 90s and 20s and worked with Huawei. While I was in Hong Kong, you for their postdoctoral career program for three years. To understand the Canadian leeway, how much flexibility it has in this complex. I, wish, I, I called up my old friends in southwestern Ontario and around Ontario who mm. are dairy farmers. After the free trade agreement, they said their five generation dairy business is going to end because of the influx of cheap US product. Okay? This is number one. Number two is I asked a few more friends in, in Canada. Hey, your American cousin is a real big gorilla now. My my question is other than being anger and distrust. How much Canadian can really work with the U.S. without being a puppet on the string? Hmm. Well, I, I think in, you know, our economies are so integrated in so many different ways. This is not just about, about trade uh, and sectors. Um, little countries like Canada that live next to big countries always have to be aware. And it's partly why we have wanted rules in our system. We want to negotiate treaties with the Americans. We want uh, settlement mechanisms with the United States that don't work perfectly. Any Canadian business person that I know knows that the rule of law only goes so far in working with the United States. They also work on the basis of interest. However, however, on balance, over time, we have been able to establish rules that generally work with the United States. Now, that was then and this is now. I've been away from Canada since the Trump administration has announced its new tariffs on Mexican products that uh, related to the influx of, uh, of immigration seekers from, uh, from going across the Mexican border. That is the kind of thing that makes Canadians shiver. Uh, we, uh, when the rules of the game can be so dramatically changed, where just as we're trying to finalize our new North American free trade agreement, the China, uh, China, huh, the, uh, the Mex uh, United States, Mexico, Canada, just as we're doing that, that at the drop of a hat, 
Uh, last year, the big issue in Canada was U.S. tariffs on Canadian aluminum and steel exports on national security grounds, that Canada was a national security threat in this area to the United States. That was, to me, one of the key moments in seeing, aha, this is techno-nationalism. They're using economic sec uh, sectors to, for political purposes. So do we trust the United States? Probably yes, uh, probably yes. Do we fully trust the United States? No chance, no chance. Do we fully trust China? Uh, no chance. Do we trust China a little bit? Um, that's in question uh, right now. I think that's a mistake. I think we can do a lot of things with the Chinese and that they're in many areas as responsible or more responsible an international actor than the United States. Not in all areas, but in, in, in many areas. Do I think that we can trust China in respecting international treaties most of the time, uh, but not all of the time? Uh, so, so, someone at the back, please. Yeah, someone at the back. I don't know. Hi, I'm Lucas, and I'm an undergraduate uh, in the University of Hong Kong. So, uh, just now you have mentioned this generally a negative opinions on China in the elites in Canada, and if a conservative leader is elected, there is a possibility that uh, the Canada may exhibit commercial activities in China. Well, but sense. given the uh, current narrative that despite slow slowing growth, uh, China remains a global engine, global growth engine, and so actually, how could um, Canada take a balance between investing in China, benefit from the economy, while taking a stance on China's issues? Well, that's, that's a great question. And I had a chance recently to meet with <clears throat> a thousand Canadian conservatives who were talking policy issues. And as, after they were angry with China, after they raised it, after they said how different our values are from Chinese values, I asked just the question you did. Do you think if you come from the province of Alberta, your energy sector is going to be able to develop without Chinese markets or without Chinese investment? Do you think your beef industry can benefit? So you can make those kind of arguments. But I would um, I'd push it even further that the case for trying to work with China, the case for trying to live with China, is not just about commodity sectors. It's about what we do to try to increase our competitiveness in high technology areas. And this is a big debate, whether closer integration with China is going to be to our detriment. They're going to steal our ideas. They're going to take our best people for some purposes, and that they can even use our best people better than we can, because they've got a system they can plug them into. That's, that's, that's one kind of argument we're hearing, or that they're a security risk. Uh, on the other hand, I kind of have a, a sense that Canadians are smart enough, once we realize the challenge, to build the rules in such a way that we benefit too. I mean, once we start, if, if I was a room of Canadians who weren't my students, and, and I asked you uh, what would be the uh, principal word you would use to describe China, well, not too many of them until very recently would use a word like innovative. Well, my young students now, for four consecutive years, I say, give me one adjective to describe China. Overwhelmingly, they're using the word innovative. The younger generation seemed to get this. My students, we had eight students with us at Huawei, and they didn't like some parts of the experiment. But on the other hand, they said, my heavens, we're seeing a place where for us to be world class, we have to learn from these guys. Uh, and how different that is than five years ago or 10 years ago uh, on it. So I think your question is a marvelous one, but it's beyond just trade issues. It's going to be around how we are going to conceive of ourselves. Let me give one last example. I have a, a son uh, who's 30 years of age. He finished high school, uh, university in Canada, a history degree, did a degree in history. Didn't know what he was going to do. <laughs> His history rocks. I agree with you on that. He didn't know what he was going to do. So he came to China on a chance visit. He looked around for a week and he said, hmm, a lot of things I don't like here, but he said, this is an interesting place. So he came back, spent three years learning Mandarin, uh, got involved in Chinese business sectors, 
and has come back very balanced in his assessment of the good in Chinese business practices, the bad in Chinese practices. But he comes back and he says, Dad, when I come back to Vancouver, I feel I'm moving backwards in time. Uh, that in infrastructure, uh, in particularly on electronic payment systems, uh, you know, uh, this, these kinds of things, it's extraordinary in some areas how fast China has moved. So me as a teacher, what I try to do is use my son's example and others, is to say this China is a very mixed picture. You can see some of the most repressive. And ho China is an encyclopedia of social problems uh, from beginning A to Z. They are huge. But there are also some things that are working. So that's where we need a knowledge to find those sectors where we can benefit. And it's going to be a lot more than sending, selling basic commodities in the future. Or lobsters. The gentleman here, please. Hi, thank you for your talk. I recently started start my career at Hong Kong U. My question is, um, so, um, so you make an argument that five years ago, those folks in Cambridge didn't think that authoritarian regime can be innovative. But yeah. now more and more people believe Something like that, that. Right. yeah. yeah. Right. So my concern is exactly that way, is, is the anger from Canada and the US to China, is, is that too the authoritarian regime, or is just China's behavior of not fully respecting mm. international law, right? So given Wonderful that, question. if China, for instance, having a hypothetical question, if China really respects international rule of law, will American and and uh, Canada or other uh, developed developed countries really uh, uh, lack Huawei or other companies like be the leader of the uh, a new innovative sector in the world, and that's similar to the case of Japan. Like, like maybe Japan is not authoritarian, but Japan respect the international rule of law. So some Japanese brand can be the yeah, leader really in the acceptable. world. But, but the argument in China is they are angry in the US and America, but they are angry in China too. Uh, as far as my reading of the Chinese social media, people in China said, no matter what, America won't trust them. So that's, that's their excuse to not respect the international rule of law. So the argument is that's, that's will be the future company. But my question is, mm, yeah. if China respects international rule of law, will America be the second stockholder? Let's just not follow it. The you mean like a new Sony? Yeah, like a new Sony. Or a Panasonic. So far, we cannot name any Chinese brand. Either, you know, only like the material, like the raw, like the basic product, not like the end product, like Sony or any. Yeah, got it. Got it. Well, maybe Huawei will be one of the first companies that does that breakthrough, Lenovo and some others. But your question is a wonderful one. and. Uh, I think that as we're trying to understand the views in the United States and Canada and some of the Western countries, for a number of our people, maybe a quarter of our people when we do the polling, China is not acceptable because of the nature of its political system, the authoritarian system, the Chinese Communist Party. They reject, they cannot be legitimate so long as they are communist. That's the kind of argument. In a second. And the, uh, uh, but I think for another category of people, it depends on Chinese behavior. I mean, during the Hu Jintao period, uh, and even more importantly in the Jiang Zemin period, as there was some kinds of opening where market reforms were sort of moving in a direction that were not a full embrace of Western capitalism, or American style capitalism, but there was some movement. The reform process was about bringing market forces into the Chinese economy in a bigger way. Um, I think for some of those people that if they see Chinese behavior, just imagine that Xi Jinping's government has a change of heart. And it goes back to some of the reform measures just on the economy from 2010, 2011, 2012. Just imagine they do that. Is that going to make the United States less afraid of China? Um, I don't know the answer. I think it's complicated. But I do not think, finally, that it will make a difference. I think that the difference between Japan and China in the American view are two things. One is the United States won the war with Japan. 
Second is that um, Japan never had the other dimensions of national power in size, in military, in its um, uh, ability to send out so many students and other things overseas. So I'm afraid that on balance, I don't think there's much that China can do uh, to lower American fear um, without some accommodation on the American side. I'm looking at your eyes, and you don't believe my answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I'd use the argument that China does want to change some rules uh, and that they are a revisionist power in a variety of areas. But I would say selective revisionist. A lot of the terms of globalization that we have liked around movement of people, movement of money, on balance, China's moving in that direction. Uh, and so that they are. But I think that it's, you've raised the deeper question, who, whose interests do the rules serve? Uh, America built the system. Uh, and it paid a cost, but it also has received enormous advantages since the um, creation of the Bretton Woods system, et cetera. So whose, whose rules are they? And I like your I question because I think that the right one to ask is not just how is China going to adjust to the rules of the system, but how can some of us help remod reframe those rules so that China can be a part of them, at least up to a point. And I think that if we're using the terms that we have seen of the US, China, economic negotiations. I mean, I was in China in the last week where people were reading what the US negotiating position was. This is leaking out in social media and other sources. And they were rigid. They thought this was like the, um, uh, what led to the May 4th movement, a country that was dictating to China terms that were completely unacceptable, that in essence said, to, be, to deal with us, you have to behave like us and uh, that you then are going to have to make the adjustments in your economy. And I think, I don't think that's the way forward. I don't think it's going to work practically, but I think for middle powers, what we try to do is devise rules that have elements of compromise in them. And this one, the key one in the Chinese context, is state-owned operations. For Canadians, that's not as difficult. We've never believed in market fundamentalism the way the Americans practice it. We had big state-owned corporations in our country. Uh, not so many anymore. But we, um, we felt that there, as part of our national uh, development, we had to do some things differently than the Americans. We funded our railways in a different way. We did our construction in a different way. So I think there's some sympathy to the challenges that China faces coming into a system that is a rigged system. It is very hard for developing countries to get beyond the middle income trap. And how we design rules that might accommodate some of Chinese interests means that a rule-based system is going to have some slightly modified rules. And how to do that intelligently, that's why you come to talk to Canadians. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Lawrence Chen. I work for the Faculty of Business in the University of Hong Kong. I'm the mission director. So you briefly mentioned about Japan. So it's interesting because it seems that Japanese are always on the bus already, get stuck. <laughs> so it seems that no matter how much they dislike the, the US, they got no choice. So to them, the strategic options are pretty simple. Just side with the US no matter what. So it seems that that's my observation. No matter how much you hate Trump or the other presidents, yeah, you I got understand. no choice. So even Japan is a much more powerful country than can Canada. So it seems that even the bigger guy, the bigger in the economic sense, has no choice. So I, I believe that the choice for Canadians are limited. 
uh, let me ask my real question. <laughs> I, I'm trying to understand, because when you talk about engagement, so when I read about this in the past, uh, you also mentioned that, look, when this concept came about, uh, especially from the Western political scholar arena, that came with the assumption that, look, the engagement will bring about changes in political system, democracy, things yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So, so that was probably the, the beginning of that, like 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So people were enthusiastic about it. So now, uh, my question is, at the senior political scholar level, are there any p professors who, whether you call them Marxists or left wings or whatever, are there any people who will believe that, look, why do we have to change them, right? Uh, uh, is there any good about the Chinese political system, even if it is authoritarian, repression, whatever? Because they have been that, they have been like that for like 5,000 years, and there are actually many other countries in the world with much bigger population than UK, Australia, and Canada, and the US, who does not, who do not have that. And those, those countries come with like thousands of years of history. So are there certain people holding that view in the scholar level that look, it's okay. So why do engagement, when it does not bring about change in political system, is that okay? So I'm, I'm curious to know whether there are people who, who hold that kind of view. Um, let me take your first part as just a comment, but on your second question, who holds that view? I'd make an argument that there's been about five generations of American scholars who have held the view that we work with China without expecting it to converge with us. And they're essentially the students of John Fairbank, Fei mm -hmm. Chung And Fairbank began from the perspective of civilizations. Fairbank does not believe there are universal values. He finds there are overlapping interests that we can call universal values but he doesn't feel there's one history and one pathway to the future. That was where he began. And it was really interesting how he framed the case for engagement. He didn't use that word. He used the word contact. In the 1950s. Remember the 1950s. The United States and China are fighting a war in Korea. This was really a, a, a hot war. Secondly, it was a period in which there were a lot of nasty things happening in the mainland. Uh, with anti-rightist campaigns, land reform campaigns. This was not a sweet time. A lot of people were losing their lives. And in the United States, it was the period of McCarthyism and anti-communism, really intense. And so how was it that Fairbank, in that period of intense public dislike of China, tried to make a case? And his case was that um, basically the, the logic of engagement that I gave you a few minutes ago but never with political liberalization. That was never part of the package. That just Canada, uh, China, excuse me, the United States and China can live together. They're gonna have huge cultural conflicts. They don't understand each other. They don't understand enough of each other, but that we can do it. So are there people making this case? Yeah, and I would suggest a large percentage of them studied at Harvard University. Uh, it was a kind of, there wasn't a school, it wasn't compulsory that you had to pass a test. But if you begin with the perspective that China is a civilization before it is a state, then that leads you into some kinds of openness about trying to deal with a country you can't change. Does that help? John well, Fairbank. What I think we might do is collect uh, a few questions and then respond. But I, 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 I give a uh, uh, question. Uh, OK. Oh. Uh, thank you, Paul. So this is uh, a great uh, overview and uh, um, especially a lot of sharing of your insights on Canada-China relations. Um, but let me follow on the, the last uh, couple of uh, questions and, and uh, comments. First, I have to say uh, I would not want to be so, uh, such an apologist. Uh, I mean, why, why not? Why shouldn't China have? political changes after economic changes. Mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm not going to say too much on that. They can't. Uh, but I do want to say that, uh, you know, we should keep uh, the historical perspective uh, in mind that uh, until uh, 
three centuries ago, there was no uh, democratic uh, country or, 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 or any country governed uh, under what we call democracy and the rule of law today. But it is really mm -hmm. a very, very recent human phenomenon. So mm. China is no mm. exception to that. Mm. So I, I don't want to get too much into this. Uh, but let me ask you more specifically. So for you to change your view and also uh, the views uh, by uh, other advisors and colleagues to the Canadian government uh, from uh, being a slight engager to a, a very convinced engager. So what would you like to see happening in China? You just say, okay, uh, I'm for full engagement. Alternatively, what would make you say, you know, I'm no longer an engager yeah. in any slightest uh, way. I'm all for uh, confrontation. Because, uh, you know, we all know if you look at any country, mm -hmm. uh, there are always things that will, uh, that, uh, will be to your liking, and there are many things yeah. uh, that are not to your liking. Uh, so if you want to, to see whether they, there are things you like in any country, you will always find some, but then what will be the triggers for you to move from one side to the other? So I'll take this question and then That's we'll a brilliant question. Uh, uh, go ahead, Paul, and then we'll, we'll collect afterwards. You have to answer the director's question. Yes, of course. Ah, <laughs> that I understand. That I understand. <laughs> And particularly when it's such a good question, what would be the trigger points? And some of it's a, it's a question we discuss quite often among the, the China watchers. I'm not a China specialist. I'm an international relations scholar. But when I talk with my deep China scholars, I say, what would be the triggers that would say, this is a country we cannot deal with, we should not deal with, we should try to contain and confront? And, you know, as we came to that view about Nazi Germany in the 1930s and the 1940s, that there was something that there in their system, there were some good things, bad things, but there were some things that were unacceptable, unacceptable. What are those unacceptable items? And um, let me give a, two examples, and they're both in foreign policy. One is if China begins to behave militarily in this region like the United States did in uh, Latin America at the turn of the last century. If China begins overthrowing governments uh, and installing governments to its, its, to its wishes. Uh, if China begins using overseas military action for purposes of uh, threatening, containing, or in some cases destroying other nations, uh, that, that puts me over on the side of containment. Uh, a third is going to be domestic. We are all so deeply upset now, us liberals, on the matter of what is happening in Xinjiang. If we found that in Xinjiang there were examples of genocide or mass killings of individuals uh, or of, of entire groups, if the Nazi Germany kind of solution came through, if it was the violent side, that would be beyond the pale. Uh, if in economic terms um, that what happens with our two Michaels starts happening, we already have lots of Michaels, by the way. There are dozens of countries that have had people illegally detained in China uh, and uh, under some pretty bad conditions. This is not unique to Canada. We just made it noisy. If China starts taking large scale hostage operations. If the Chinese, in other words, let me put it differently. A hard question for me about the future is what kind of great power is China wanting to be? Is it wanting to be a great power in the sense of what Japan was in the 1930s with the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, using economic and military instruments to try to create a, an empire, a zone? That's possible. If it happened, then we contain China, uh, or we try to contain China, good luck, uh, but we try. Is it going to be um, like uh, a Nazi Germany with a very distinctive form of nationalism 
and actions? Maybe if it behaves like Nazi Germany to its own citizens and to its neighbors, I say we confront. But what I'm most worried about is that China as a great power is going to see that how you behave is how the United States behaves or how the United States behaved at an earlier period. We talk about Chinese assertiveness or aggression in the South China Sea. I'm concerned about many of their actions there. But boy, put this in comparison to what the United States did in the Americas in the 19th and early 20th century. You want to see aggression, what that meant uh, in terms of dominating, not allowing foreign powers into the region, then that scares me. So this is the beginning of a longer discussion uh, on this matter, but there are limits. There are limits, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that China is not going to transgress those, that there are internal forces and traditions that will keep it from them, but I don't think we're going to discourage Chinese behavior by isolating them. That's the other side of this. Uh, lock them away and it's gonna get worse. So there's three questions as far as I can There's somebody at the back. Uh, uh, who had his hands raised, then you, sir. Maybe we can pick, pick you in. Just be brief, please. Okay. We'll collect them all. Uh, thank you. Uh, I grew up in Shenzhen and graduated from UBC several years ago. So, yeah, I'm, uh, my, my question, because uh, I'm studying the uh, authoritarian politics and courts, especially in China, in faculty for HKU. And uh, my question is uh, more in terms of China, maybe. Uh, is that there's a theory that the in, in uh, the Chinese government is used because there's a many crises uh, in many aspects like economy and and, and many and uh, we have to know that in the authoritarian context there's a huge discrepancy between the government and the the, the, the people so the Chinese government maybe use the foreign crisis like Meng Wanzhou and the other similar uh, incidents as their crisis moment to boost the uh, the, to, to try to capture the people, try to use like a propaganda to boost the nationalism and to save the regime from, from that aspect. So maybe, uh, of course, it's one of the major theory. Is it? I, I just want to know uh, your view about that. Uh, Do whether, you think it's true? Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, um, I was educated uh, in U.S. and Canada, and also worked in Canada for many years before I came back to Hong Kong for 30 years when right I retired. Anyway, I got a lot of relationship with Canada. And uh, my question is, I'm really disappointed to see the Can Canadians are so hostile to China. Okay, they don't like the, the theft of the intellectual property. I mean, put it on court. If they make real mistakes, if they steal, they put it on court and, and penalize them, okay? I mean, this is property ownership, is that yes. what you said? Yes, I mean, why not? Why put it on court, you know, it's not hostile. Okay, the money is obviously the puppet of the US. It's a political issue, okay, we know that. And China has the right, okay, of banning the oil as a retaliation, okay. I think, I think it's the right thing, okay, because you are hostile to, to, Ken, to China, okay, why are you doing the money, you know? And uh, you mentioned that uh, the, U the Western, they don't like China because the political system, because they are not like, mm -hmm. what's wrong with that? Sir? I mean, because they are t different. I mean, they have, okay, you look at China, you have been in China for many years. China people are more happier than right now than before. When you ask the people, they are more satisfied their country right now. Okay, this is something you can prove that, sir. okay. And when you look compare the, the U.S., what they did to the Latin America, I mean, I'm surprised the Canadian, they are more biased to, to U.S. than China. China have done nothing wrong. Right now, they initiate the Bell and, and, and Road Initiative. What's wrong with that then, okay? This is helping the whole, I mean, I mean, U.S. is going to withdraw from the Paris uh, environmental plan, okay? Climate. China is supporting that thing. I mean, China is doing a lot of good things right now. I mean, China changed, okay? China changed, okay? Okay, that's all. Uh, yeah, my name's Eric. I just I work in policy and regulatory affairs here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are you a Canadian? Yes, I'm from Vancouver, actually, as well. Never went to UBC, though, went to SFU. Are you a panda hugger? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll see with the question, but... Uh, I'll wait to hear the question. I'll keep it really, really brief. Um, just looking at the, the Huawei situation, do you think, was it, is it your opinion 
um, that perhaps Canada paint itself in a corner and restrict its negotiating power uh, by immediately putting down the rule of law argument, as opposed to maybe doing that either later or uh, in a different way. Great. And one last question. Please. No, madam. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Christy, and I'm currently a part-time student on the Master um, of International and Public Affairs program. Um, so Is that the MIPA program, the Masters of International yes. and Public Affairs? Yes. I used to teach in the program. Great program. We had brilliant students perform. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I'm actually extremely fascinated by sort of the technological side of things as, in terms of geopolitics. And um, so in terms of China and Canada, um, and in terms of the areas of AI, um, so I, I, I do believe that according to scholars, Chinese scholars and partially Chinese officials, it seems that they have already decided on having AI as a key sort of puzzle piece of the, the competition yes, and how I agree. they can sort of win the fourth industrial revolution and become the great power. And so in that context, and after having read you know, Kai Fuli and others, it, it seems that 70% of the economic benefits of the technology will be shared between the two big powers, China and US. In that context, I'm very, very interested in how Europe, and maybe in this sense, uh, how Canada can carve out a national AI policy that can fully be sort of um, prepared to, to, to do well in, in this stage where it's not the biggest power, but it has potential. I know uh, yeah. Canada is very strong in blockchain and yeah. AI. Um, I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts. Paul, the floor is yours. You can select. I, I'm afraid we just have two minutes, and yes. you know I have to break. Yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, well, my answer is you better invite me back for another session. <laughs> uh, that there's a variety of questions here on nationalism. Uh, very interesting comment about how to judge China, by what standards we judge it, uh, and a uh, uh, Huawei and rule of law question. Uh, and then the, the wonderful question about technology and geopolitics and artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, these are, you know, professors talk too long. We use more words than were necessary. I'd like to be able to answer each of them in one word. On nationalism as a driving force, et cetera, et cetera, no. Uh, on China and its, um, the case for the exceptionalist nature of the Chinese regime and history, um, okay, but it's an imperfect record. There's a lot that needs to be improved. The uh, third on Huawei and the rule of law, we painted ourselves into a corner, uh, is the kind of question. I think the answer is yes. The more interesting question is how we maintain room to get ourselves out of that corner uh, going forward. But I want to spend just a little bit, the one minute remaining on the MIPA students question about uh, AI and China. And as you described it very, very, very carefully, you said, China has sees AI as a route in the fourth industrial revolution to becoming the great power. That was your phrase. Not a great power. You said the great power. I might be wrong. And this is something as a proposition I put that we out there we test. I think on balance now, China does not want to become the new United States. I don't think it feels it can. I don't think it feels it should be. But it does feel it can be a great power. And that the monopoly of the United States on the commanding heights of technology, which is not perfectly an American dominated role, but that American supremacy in those areas is subject to challenge. And that I would put the following out. Five years ago, well, three years ago, if you had put the proposition to me, which country do we think offers Canada the greatest benefit for us to move ahead economically, technologically, and as part of a global system as compared to uh, with our next door neighbor or with a particular country? What's the best route forward in globalization right now? I'd have said hands down the United States. I can't say that anymore. Uh, the question is, do we think China is going to be the country that when we want to see defense of global supply chains, when we want to see defense of students moving in and out of, of the country, um, 
I would have said, again, three years ago, it's the United States, don't be dummy. I don't think we feel that anymore. So um, I'm relatively optimistic that if we can find ways to keep doors open, that China will be an advantage in a globalized world rather than the impediment. On balance, not all areas, but most areas. So that's my answer. Do you agree? Only one word, yes or no. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, let me just um, thank Paul. Uh, I bring it back to basketball. Paul, I'm sorry I likened you to a raptor because you are by no means a dinosaur in the business. Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, in fact, if anything, you are the golden warrior. Uh, I took out the word state because, you know, state. But anyway, um, so, so thank you again very much for your um, uh, insights, uh, for sharing your knowledge, and uh, uh, we really appreciate it and hope you'll uh, come back and visit us in Hong Kong often and at the Asia Global Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you.